you now find yourself lost in Irving Land. Last time, Dr. Smith had ordered the robot to pick off the Robinson family one by one as it caught them alone. The chariot was broken down and Will was sure he could fix it. He snuck out at night to try it and the robot just found him. It's chased him up on top of the chariot. At the ship, Dr. Robinson and Don are getting ready to go look for him. Smith, where are you going? Just on my way to prepare a little after-dinner surprise. You may not be aware of it, but I happen to be... You may not be aware of what's going to happen to you if your friend the robot causes any more trouble. My friend? Well, you programmed him so he only obeys your voice. An oversight on my part. Then it should be easy enough to fix, right? You can come with us and do that right now. Or is there some reason you don't want to fix that little oversight? Stop, my mechanical friend. Before you continue, my metallic cohort, I must put you through a routine check. Temporary delay allowed. Circuits open for routine check. We saw last time that he can imitate Smith's voice and cadence well enough to fool the robot. Good thing he remembered in time. Get Smith. Tell him you'll put him back in that deep freeze if he doesn't get out here and stop this. King's pawn to King's five. Queen's Knight to King's Bishop 2. Regular people need a board to keep track of a chess game. If you play like I do, it doesn't matter whether you have a board or not because you lose either way. Will Robinson don't need no stinking board. He'll do it the computer's way in his head. Ah, Major West. Just in time to test a culinary marvel. The crepe Suzette Henri Carpentier de Paris, which I learned at the feet of the master. Get outside and stop that tin monster or I'll wring your neck. Smith approves of the way Will handled the robot. Goody, goody gumdrops. Cease and desist. Just another moment, my boy. Ah. There, there, my brave boy. It's all over now. You take your hands off him. My dear madam. Don't you dear madam me, turning that thing loose on him. But I had nothing to do with it. The robot takes orders from one, count them, one person. So either you ordered him to do that, or he's gone rogue and needs to be destroyed. Which is it, Doctor? That night, Dr. Robinson announces that they're going to have to turn the area into a self-sufficient community if they're going to survive. That means growing food, purifying water, and protecting ourselves from whatever hostile life might be out there, like Debbie. Next day, the work begins and we see Dr. Smith doing what he does best, avoiding it. Ah, excellent work, gentlemen, excellent. You don't suppose you could give us a hand with this heavy gear, do you? I mean, we'd like to get this force field set up before nightfall. Uh, so sorry, old man. I promised to help Miss Judy in the garden. But carry on. And indeed, he did promise to help Judy. Well, now, how are we coming along? Where have you been? Helping your father and Major West set up the force field. Very important work, my dear. They required my advice on a technical problem. What do you know? He's just in time to miss all the work. What a shame. Except he's not. There's still a section to be done. But guess what? Ford, I mean Smith, has a better idea. Incredible. What is it? This native soil has all the richness of the Mississippi Delta. Fine, heavy loam. Does he understand what loam is and what sand is? Because if he thinks loam pours like that, he's been to some weird places. Ah, yes. Don said it wasn't safe to use any of the native soil. Ridiculous. However, I will take a little sample of this to the lab for a soil analysis. And he does indeed take a soil sample and head inside to test it. Now that he's contaminated it with earth plants and bacteria, something tells me he's not all that interested in doing science. Well, what is our young scientist working on today? A visual scanner. I figured I could repair the one that got ruined in the wreck. It won't work as good as new, but it ought to show what's going on within a radius of a few miles. Darn. Can you lend me a hand for a few minutes? My dear boy, I would be doing you a disservice if I offered assistance. Something tells me he's not all that interested in doing anything. Little setbacks are good for the young. They build character. Besides, I have an important experiment in the laboratory. While he's fixing the scanner, maybe Will can throw in a baloney detector. Smith takes the sample into the kitchen, throws it in the trash, and pours himself a cup of coffee. Dr. Smith, what are you doing here? My dear madam, there are limits to the endurance of mere bone and sinew. 
I have been going at top speed all day and I've reached the point of exhaustion. However, I'm happy to say that not only have I solved our hydroponic farming problems, but also we shall shortly be enjoying the fruits of my labors from behind an impregnable defense system, to which I also contributed. Her face says she believes him about as much as we do. But what's the point? Smith is going to Smith. At least he hasn't done any harm lately. Dr. Smith planted the seeds. I found them just now. They grew overnight. Well, Doctor, what do you make of it? Uh, just a small offering on my part toward the welfare of his brave company. This one part alone should provide us with days of nutritious eating. May I? I may need to revise that. Would it be a good idea to test it first and make sure it's not poisonous? Or even venomous? This one part alone should provide us with days of nutritious eating. Or maybe you'll provide it with days of nutritious eating. Oh, Will. Ah, good lad. We saw Will run back inside the ship when Judy called the others to come look at the garden. Now we know what he was doing. Excellent shooting, my boy, excellent. I'll take over now. What were you doing when my mother and sisters needed you? I was about to run for a weapon, of course. Prepare to sell my life dearly in mortal combat uh, to defend your relatives. I'll bet you were. You can believe him, Will. Just don't notice that big brown spot on the back of his trousers. The men have finished fixing the chariot and are on their way back to the ship, but they're hitting some rough ground that they were sure wasn't like that before. Maybe that's why. And unlike Smith, Dr. Robinson actually took and analyzed the soil sample. He found some identical life forms both in the soil and in some of the pieces of the thing that incubated inside that pea pod. And the soil of this planet contains a parasite requiring another life form in order to reach maturity. Way to go, Smith. The food supply was safe until you helped. That night, Will can't sleep. They've brought the robot back to the ship, still deactivated. He's convinced he can fix the robot, so he sneaks out to do so. What's that? A sound. I know that, Dopey. What kind of sound? Hey, wait, where are you going? Unidentified sounds require investigation. And he fixed it so well it wandered off. Worse, it turns off the force field so it can wander off. Dr. Robinson comes out and turns the force field back on, then tells Will, we'll talk in the morning. Will, you happen to be a, a very bright and very talented boy, all right? Now, look at me. But you're still a boy. And there are some things that even the brightest, most talented boys should leave to older hands. Now, with a little patience and a little time, we could have reprogrammed that robot to do its job. But because you acted without thought or permission, we lost a piece of valuable equipment that we needed very badly. And that's all I'm going to say to you about the robot. I'm going to put this huge guilt trip on you, and that's all I'm going to say. Have a nice day, kid. Well, what do you know? He's finally decided to come back. I guess you can forget about that guilt trip, Will. Data inaccurate. Does not compute. Does not compute. Does not compute. What in the world is he talking about? Humanoid, not 16 meters high. Data inaccurate. He's flipped. Well, if you ask me, I think the thing's had a nervous breakdown. Mm, does not compute. I guess he needs a rest. It's been a big day for him. I wonder what he saw. He told you what he saw. He saw a humanoid 16 meters high. It was really Allison Hayes trying to audition for Attack of the 50-Foot Woman. A few weeks pass as we learned from Dr. Robinson's journal. We have since learned how to plant safely in this alien soil and to domesticate some of its strange ostrich-like animals. Don't expect to see any of them, just take his word for it. I'm really not sure why they did that. The amazing growth rate of the soil has already provided us with an adequate food supply. Today, however, a new problem presented itself. Why should it die overnight? I don't know. It's been colder than this, but not cold enough to kill the plants. They have a weather station set up that should have warned them if cold was coming. Maybe Don and I had better check that weather station. Hmm. 
We watch them climb up a cliff that looks remarkably like the one John originally fell on, or that could just be my imagination. Look at this thing. But the day after tomorrow, the temperature will drop 150 below zero. What do we do? We're gonna have to head south, but fast. Which way is that on this planet, Professor? One of their scanners is smashed in a footprint. Time to go. Now we're gonna see what the robot saw. Well, hold on, I have a question. He's wearing shoes. How do he make those footprints? They landed on Cyclops Island. It hasn't done anything overtly hostile yet. Basically, it's moving its arms in a hugging motion and making that noise. I get the feeling it has a limited vocabulary, so maybe it's trying to communicate. They're not interested in finding out because trying to shake hands could be disastrous. They duck into a nearby cave. Back at the ship, Will is still working on the visual scanner while Penny and Judy pick vegetables and Maureen does the laundry. Don't pick too many, dear. I won't, Mother. If we had those, most American bachelors wouldn't smell the way they do. Will has gotten the scanner operating, but he's not sure what he found. See something? Oh, a giant! Let me look again. Did either of them take a gun with them? Why do their minds automatically go to violence? What's this giant doing? It's standing there looking around. It hasn't done anything hostile except be 16 meters tall. But this is what we humans do. We go into a new place and immediately start fighting with the inhabitants. We'll never know what Polyphemus there had in mind because nobody's taking the time to evaluate things and plan a way to try to talk to this thing. Will has his own ideas. Will! Will, you come back here, do you hear me? Will! 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 Be sure to yell at him through the glass window. That's the best way to make sure he's hearing you. In the cave, the men have discovered there's no other way out. They have some flares for light, but Don's decided they look like weapons. No, wait! Wait, no one to be stoned to death! We're safe in here! If we get him any matter, we'll tear this mountain apart! Sorry, Doc. <laughs> That certainly cleared things up. Now it's sure you're hostile and it'll need to protect itself against you. Bear in mind, it wasn't doing anything threatening except just standing there wondering what these new insects are and you struck first without real provocation. It was probably just curious before. Now it's angry. I guess I didn't help that as much, did I? At least we know he can feel pain. Yeah, he knows we're hiding in here. And it's determined to get you one way or another. See, it does have human traits. When you're not sure what a creature is, poke it with a stick and find out. I have an order here for your execution for the crime of being really, really big. The resulting cave-in buried the two men alive and they were never found. Will took over the expedition and his first order of business was to have the robot give Dr. Smith a lobotomy. Dr. Robinson shows his gratitude by jumping down Will's throat for leaving his post when he was supposed to be guarding the family, which is to say the women. Let's see, he got the robot working and his dad reamed him for that. He saved these two from the giant and his dad reamed him for that. I'm starting to think Will needs to take a page from Dr. Smith's book and start doing as little as possible. He might get in less trouble if he quits accomplishing stuff. I don't know what 
kind of bug stung me, but I'm sure I need to step on it now. Preparations are underway to head south, except for one thing. Leave the ship. Are you out of your collective mind? Here we have simple comforts, a more than adequate cuisine, ample protection from the perils of the planet, and you want me to leave. If it comes down to it, they didn't want you there in the first place. It's either that or freeze to death. My dear sir, Zachary Smith would rather freeze to death intact than provide a few morsels for some carnivorous giant. First, you don't know they're carnivorous. That giant still hadn't done anything truly threatening. Second, human icicle or giant poop, either way you're dead. So what's the difference? No, you do as you please. I shall stay here. It's your funeral, Smith. Just leave me a few necessities. I feel confident that I shall survive. We'll leave you all we can spare. It's getting colder, the chariot is all packed, and it's time to go. Where's Penny? Where's your sister? She was riding on the turtle, she and the blue. Apparently, we decided that Debbie's species is called the blue. Then all of a sudden, she was gone. Well, where did she go? I don't know. I turned around and she wasn't there anymore. She was riding a turtle. I'm going to guess the turtle was moving because it was trying to get this thing off its back. And by the way, turtle? Professor Robinson straps into a James Bond-type jetpack to go look for it. He tells Don, when the temperature reaches 10 below, you take off, with or without me. I'm cold. If I kiss pneumonia from this, they're never ever going to let me play with either of you again. With those feelers, it looks more like a giant abalone, but it does have a turtle's head, so I guess. I knew turtles were stubborn, but I thought you'd have more sense than to run away. And as slow as it was moving, it thought you'd have the good sense to climb off before it got you lost. So I guess you're even. But not to worry, Daddy to the rescue. He has Penny and Debbie climb piggyback onto the jetpack where they're sure to be incinerated by the heat coming from the nozzles, and they head back. The temperature has reached 10 below. It's time for the chariot to go. We can't leave without Daddy and Penny. We just can't. We have to. We'll all die if we don't. Don, please, just a few more minutes. You think I'd like to leave without them? When Dr. Robinson said 10 below zero, he didn't just pick a number out of a hat. That's the deadline, with the emphasis on dead if we don't stick to it. No, no, I'm not leaving without them. Don't start the motor. Don, I'm warning you. Warning him? What are you threatening him with? If he starts the motor, you'll go plant a big kiss on Dr. Smith? And you do realize that the professor knows which way you're going since he set the course so he can catch up with you easily with the jetpack. It's not like that chariot moves at IndyCar speeds or something. <laughs> I could be mistaken. Mom, look! But by the time he landed and got himself and Penny aboard, the temperature had already reached 11 below and it was too late. The whole family froze to death two miles out from the ship. They're rolling along nicely when they come upon an old friend. And this time he's armed, but sadly for him, bringing boulders to a laser gun fight isn't terribly effective. Once again, let's ask who inflicted injury on whom first before even thinking about a possible non-violent alternative. Hint, it wasn't the giant. We get a full 45 seconds of them driving past its corpse and just staring at it from toe to head. It's way too long and dull. I know it's supposed to be impressive, but he was more impressive when he was throwing rocks. And as it turns out, those rocks did do some damage to the chariot. They'll have to stop and camp for the night so Don can fix it. John and Maureen are seeing to food. Will is playing a guitar and singing, and from what I can see, he's really playing it, or at least he's forming the chords right. Penny is trying to make Debbie into a doll, Don is fixing the chariot, and Judy is watching slash helping him. Oh, Dad, bet you don't know what I saw. What? 
Judy and Don. He was kissing her on the hand like this. Then he picked up a million germs. Just wait till you learn about the germs he's going to give her after you go to sleep. Well, Penny, dear, young people sometimes have ways of doing things which, to wiser heads such as you and I, may seem a little strange. In other words, I should mind my own business? That's right. I thought so. <laughs> Next day, they resume their journey. At least until that happens. Time to find a cave to take shelter in because his lightning could blow out every circuit in the chariot and then some. But there's something unusual about this cave. Those sure looked like they were artificially carved. It's a city! There are no cities out here for crying out loud. Then what is it? Some sort of geological accident. How do I know? Ask Don. My feels electronics. Well, pardon me. I don't think even you believe that, Will. Geological accidents don't produce smoothly carved pillars in perfect rows. Ask Don. He'll tell you. They set off to explore in hopes that nobody lives here anymore and they can ride out the storm. But predictably, Debbie wanders off. Also predictably, Penny wanders off after her. Hey, Penny! Will, Debbie's gone. You women are always getting lost. Because you know exactly where you are right now, correct? Debbie! Debbie, where are you? Are you here? Hey, look, pictures. We have no time for those. I I've got to find Debbie. Debbie! Give me a good look at that. It's roughly the size of an adult human and it has two eye sockets so it's not related to the giant. And now we know what this place is, a catacomb. <coughs> and now you're part of it. Don and Judy come looking for the kids. Well, this should be easy. Just have him walk around the end of that wall there. Remember what the door did, kids. The door is closing! We're trapped! Never mind. It's an earthquake. No, it's a whatever the name of this planet is quake. While John and Maureen are simultaneously trying to avoid falling architecture and looking for the others, Don is doing the only thing he can think of. And we have our cliffhanger. Considering that those two boulders the giant threw at it did such damage to the chariot, by the time this is done, they may have to scrape it up with a spatula. Once they're done scraping themselves up with a spatula. But did any spatulas survive the quake? We'll see the answers to this and other burning questions next time we get lost in Irvingland.